Welcome back to our workshop. Today I'm working on this Hoosier cabinet. Now in a previous episode I showed how to take a broken tambour door and repair it so it operates properly. But this cabinet needs a number of other things done to it. I've got some broken hardware here and I've got replacement parts but you can see they're far too shiny. So I'll show you how I tarnish an age metal like this. There are also issues with the door frames where this furniture was previously stripped so these joints are loose. And this has got a tip-out bin. This is a flower bin, and it's not that functional for the customer to use. So what I'll be doing is opening up the space and modifying it a little bit to put some shelves in here so that this can be usable space. A little bit about modernizing the cabinet. Stick with me, I'll show you how it's done. As a furniture repair business, we're opening the doors to our workshop to show you the tools and techniques to repair furniture. The front rail here, you can see this has been broken off. We give you tips to make your repair projects easier. Let's get into the workshop and start fixing furniture. Sponsored by Kennedy Hardware, offering restoration hardware for antique furniture. Now if you missed the episode on how to repair this tambour door, it was in really rough shape. It was in multiple pieces. I ended up taking it out of the cabinet and then repairing it on the workbench, clamping it and putting new fabric on the back before installing it. And there was a viewer that made a comment that made me belly laugh. So I want to share it with you. Van says, you walked up to that broken tambour door and said, who's your daddy? As a Hoosier cabinet, it really made me laugh. So thank you, Van, for that like comment. Um, we'll be sending you this Wouldn't It Be Nice furniture repair sticker as a thank you for bringing some joy to the channel. Now, the first place I'm going to start here is the hardware. I had to order new hardware. So I'll show you the new hardware pieces that I have here, and then I'll get into some of the adjustments I'm going to make on this cabinet. I purchased this Hoosier cabinet hardware from Kennedy Hardware. This replacement latch goes here. There's another one for here. And the plan for this door is to change it from a tilt-out to a regular door like this. So I've got Hoosier cabinet hinges and there is a latch that I've got for here as well. So it's gonna have hinges latch. The hardware we're gonna keep, but I do have some replacement hardware here that's going to match. So all of this is brass, and the cabinet that this sits on will have this type of hardware. So I need to tarnish the brass down to look like this, and that way it'll allow me to get a finish that is consistent across this cabinet, but looks very similar to the lower cabinet. I'll show you two different techniques for aging this hardware, one with household products and another one with chemicals. I'm going to start by taking off all the doors, that way I can repair them, and this one is the easiest one to take apart. This bin just tilts out and then lifts out. So it's just held in by a couple of pins here, and this is just a regular cabinet door, and it's got four screws holding this flower bin on. So I'm going to take the flower bin off. Uh, that way the customer can hang on to it, and if they want to reverse this repair and get it back with a flower bin in the cabinet, they can do that in the future. I'll just label these doors so I know exactly where they go when I need to put them back on. That way it's all going to go together well. I don't have to second guess it. So this is my bottom left. I'll call that the middle, I'll call this the top right, and we're ready to go. Hardware on furniture can give you a bit of a hint about the age of the piece. You can see these are square head screws. These are called Robertson screws. They were invented in Canada. And these became popular around 1930. And in Canada, we've got screwdrivers that look very colorful. So the red is a number eight, the green is a number six. So it's a number six I'm using to take out here. And the style of the screw also shows you this is more of a modern screw, so this cabinet hardware isn't really all that old. You can see the screws on the latch hardware here are slotted screws, and this is what I would expect to see on an antique piece of hardware. So I'm getting a few hints about the age of this particular piece. And this screw looks modern, not like what I'd expect from an antique. Now this is odd, I've got two slotted screws here and the rest are Robertson. Now, I was told by the owner that someone had refinished this cabinet, so perhaps they took the slotted screws out and replaced them. That might be part of the story here. I've taken one screw out, and you can see that the threads don't go all the way up to the head, so that's definitely an older screw. But I'm having a real hard time with this screw here. I can't get a grip on it at all. None of my screwdrivers are allowing me to pull that out. So this might explain why some of these screws were replaced when this was refinished. You can see it looks like perhaps the finish was put on around this hinge. So I'm going to have to get up my grinder, cut a slot in that so I can pull that screw out. Now 
Now this is likely the original screw from the hardware. You can see it's a pan head, unlike the round head I've been pulling out. And if I look at the hardware I bought from Kennedy Hardware, it's the exact same screw. So that's going to work out well. I've got all the doors off now and I'm learning more about this cabinet. This one hinge that was here that was stuck on, there's finish behind it. And this tells me that there was probably a painted finish on this at one point. There, I'm seeing some other components here like this crown molding that are brand new and the back of this cabinet is not original. So there's been a number of modifications done to this cabinet already. I can also see where the latches were. There are different holes. So the hardware has been changed. I see that here on the hinged positions as well. So there's been a lot of work on this, a lot of modifications. As I said, there's going to be one more modification that I'm making to this cabinet, and that's over here on this side. Now, as I prepare to put shelves in this side here, I'm a little bit more puzzled about this cabinet. The center and the bottom and top are all made out of solid wood, but on the end, we've got frame and panel. Frame and panel is great because it controls wood movement and creates a stable cabinet. But in the center here, I've got a center that will be expanding in the summertime and contracting in the wintertime. A very puzzling mix. So I'm suspecting it was an amateur woodworker that put this cabinet together, not a manufacturer. So I have to control wood movement on the right hand side here. Uh, what I need to do is glue together a couple of boards to get the solid wood shelves that I need in here. Now I learned my woodworking skills from designing and building custom furniture for customers. So I'll show you the process I use to laminate boards together and get them prepared for making these shelves. Take the boards off the saw, I stack them specifically so I know the front edge on both of them. That's because when I put them together, I want to make sure that this looks as seamless as possible. But you see, if I just stack them front to back, you can really see the seam. So by turning it around and putting those arrows face to face, what I end up with is a board where the seam is less noticeable because of the grain pattern. Now when gluing together two boards, you need to make sure you've got a perfect seam here. And you can see, if I look down here at this end, there's a slight little bit of a gap between them. The glue won't hold there, so what I need to do is use my jointer plane to get that perfectly straight, and then I'll have a strong glue joint. Now what I want to do is sandwich these two boards face to face, and that way if my plane's off a little bit, the angle will complement each other, and I'll end up with a flat board. So I'll open this up here. Put the two boards in, and now I've got a secure surface to use the joiner plane. On this end where I don't have a clamp, I'll just add one here, and then I'm ready for the plane. This is a smoothing plane, this is a jack plane, and this is a jointer plane. This is what I'm going to use. I just need to extend the blade here, and then we can do a test pass. So nice long shavings are what we're looking for. I'm not square yet, but I'm looking for a shaving that goes across the full board. I've taken some shavings off and now what I want to do is put a pencil line across here and then I can tell where I've planed and where I haven't planed. Okay, I'll unclamp this here, stand this board up, and we'll see what the joint looks like. When I stand up the board like this, I want to see that it's going to stand on its own, but also inspect the joint to see if I can see any light through it. I've got a little bit of tune-up to do here. I've got good contact. It's a little bit open here. So just a little more leveling out, and we'll be good to go.
I'm really happy with the fit now. I put some clamps on just to make sure. And this is gonna be a bit of a workout, but it's good exercise. If you don't wanna use a hand tool like this, a power joiner is the tool you'll need to buy. So I'm going to get this set up here. Once I have the glue on, I have to move very quickly. So the filming is likely not gonna be that detailed, but I'll show you how I set it up and get ready for a glue up. Because once the glue is on, I've only got about five minutes before I have to get everything clamped in place. I've got some board here that I use to stand up the boards and that way I can get the clamps underneath. I've got clamps here. And these blocks I use to help make sure that the boards are even. Okay, so here goes the glue up. The glue's gotta go on, as I said, very quickly and spread. So I'm using an artist brush here. What I wanna do is make sure I've got full coverage across that glue seam so that there's no spot that doesn't have glue on it. Now, don't be concerned about excess glue coming out the side because we'll clean that up afterwards. So there's one side. Some people debate you should only put it on one side. I say put it on both. That way, if you do miss a spot on one side, you've got glue on the other. Okay, and then the next step is I'm gonna lay this down, one board on top of the other, and then clamp it together like this. Now it does become slippery as you do this and if you just slide it back and forth it actually helps again spread some of that glue. So I'm just going to temporarily put one clamp here, another clamp down on this end because the first thing I want to do is get a clamp in the center. So these boards will be out of alignment at uh, some point along the way here. And all I'm doing is starting in the middle, aligning the board, and then I can align the other parts as I go. So now I've got that seam exactly the way I want it. I can apply clamping pressure. Now, you don't want to put clamps all on one side because they tend to pull. So this way, I'm able to get the clamp underneath here, squeeze it tight, and we've got good clamping pressure. So over, under, next is over, and then just keep alternating to apply clamping pressure. So here's what the clamping looks like. As I said, over, under, over, under is the pattern. And you might wonder about the glue cleanup. What I do is wait for about 30 minutes and then scrape off the glue. If I were to try and wash that off, the glue would get in the grain and it would mess up the finish when I go to put on the stain. So 30 minutes, come back and scrape it and then let it sit for 24 hours to come to full strength. The next glue up is for these doors. Now I showed you a little bit before, you can see there's some separation happening here on the railing style in here. But on this next door, I've got a separation at the top, but not at the bottom. So I'm not sure how this is going to come apart. You can see this one here is tight as well, but it's loose at the top. So the easiest way to take these apart is by putting them in the vise. But there's some pretty cool attachments on these. I'll flip them over and show you. This door has a hanger here and it's on a spring and this is for holding the cookbook. So you can pull the cabinet open, put your cookbook in here and use that as a reference as you're making something. This one over here at the top of the door has a pair of square hooks and I'm not sure what that's used for. If you've seen one of these and you know what this is for, uh, let me know. I'd love to hear about it. On this door here, this is called a rail and this is called a style and this is put together in a way where there's a tenon in here. So because of this, we've got a surface here, 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 and here, there's a lot of gluing surface. So I'll see if I can wiggle this apart. It's a little bit loose. 
So what I'll do is put it in the vise here and see if I can pull it apart. So vise is great because I've got all the weight of the workbench to help pull this apart rather than try to pull it apart with my hands. I can see there's a bit of movement there. I'll move this around. Yeah, you can see there's movement there, but it doesn't want to release. So all I need to do is take some white vinegar, put it in here, and this should release the joint. So put it in both sides, let that soak in for about five minutes, come back and probably take that apart. Now on a door like this where I've got a tight joint down here and a loose joint here, you can see just how loose this is. If I were to try and take this off, I'd risk breaking something here. So what I need to do is expand this as much as possible, clean out any residue that I can, and then inject some glue and clamp it back together again. Okay, it's been about five minutes, so I'll clamp this in here. Let's see if I can pull it apart. Yep, there we go. And this one's opened up as well. Let's see if this one will come apart. There we go. Okay, so I can glue that back together now. The glue up process for these doors isn't difficult, provided you use a few things. One is hide glue. So hide glue um, will allow you to glue these together, but also take them apart in the future. It's the only reversible glue that's on the market. So you wanna use hide glue. And then what I also use is a brush to spread that glue on all surfaces. And in my cabinet up here, I've got syringes, so I use a syringe in these areas where I can't get the door apart here, but I need to get glue in up here. Now, as you can see, I've got a clean tenon here, but I've got some residue here, so I wanna clean that off. So I'll just use a scraper to rub that down, and that just gives me a clean gluing surface so the glue can stick properly. On this joint here where I can't pull the door apart, there's a bit of residue. Let's see if I try to close this up, it's preventing it from closing. So I use a thick sewing needle that I keep on my workbench and it's gonna be a little painstaking, but what I need to do is clear out the residue on the front here, up in here in the mortise, and hopefully I can get that to close tight. Yeah, it's starting to get there. I'll work it down and then we can get the glue in there. So to glue this up, I need to open it as much as possible. I've got a wedge here. I'm gonna put that back in here, or I won't be damaging any visible wood. If I were to put it on the front here, I could damage the face of the door. So now what I can do is take my syringe. Now, unfortunately, I can't get glue right along that edge, but if I squeeze my syringe here, you can see the glue come out. So I'm gonna work it in all the way down one side and then down the other side. And then what I could do is take the wedge out, put a little bit on the inside of those cheeks, the either side here and here, and then I'll clamp it up. I'll clamp this up here, and I'll do the same with the other two doors, and we're good to go. Now, if you've never built frame and panel doors before, um, essentially what you want to do is only glue the rail, this is the rail, and the style together. You never glue the panel, the panel always floats. And that is allowing for wood movement. This is a solid wood panel, so it's going to move. And that's why these style of doors were created 
to allow wood movement so the door won't break. So I'll get these all loaded up here, clamp it up, and then we can move on to the next part of the project. While I'm letting the glue dry on everything, I can start aging the products. Now, using household products, it does take some time, so I'm going to start this work, let it sit overnight, and we can take a look at it in the morning. I'm working on a black surface as well as a white surface, and what I find is this allows me to see the colors better on uh, the two different surfaces. I'll show those to you up close, and then we'll get out the household products. So here are the handles. This is the brass one. This is the existing one. And the color of metal on this is different than the rest, so here's a steel hinge. And here's a brass hinge. You can see the dramatic difference there. And here's a latch, and here's the broken latch. So these ones aren't too difficult to read in terms of color, but put them over here, they look pretty similar. So you can see why, in some cases, it works to look at the lighter color background than the darker. So this is a tool that you can use to help you as you're working through a process like this. The first household product we've got is nail polish remover. This is going to take off any oil, greases, or any lacquer that's on here. The second is household white vinegar, and the third is salt. So vinegar will actually take rust off of metals. It's a slight acid. The salt, as you know, corrodes metal. So we're going to use a combination of these two to get the metal to react and change color. So we'll start with the nail polish remover. The key ingredient in many nail polish removers is acetone, and that's the chemical we need to clean off the lacquer and any grease on the hardware. But there are some products out there that are non-acetone nail polish removers. You don't want to use these ones, we need the one that's got the acetone in it. I'll show you how this works on a hinge, so we'll go through the full process with just one hinge. So I need to clean this off, make sure there's no lacquer or any oils from your hands so it doesn't interfere with the process. Now if you want to use straight acetone you can certainly do that but it's just more common I think for people to have you nail know, polish remover around it's, it's more accessible than straight acetone is. So I need a glass container with a lid that can seal and what I'm going to do is put some vinegar in and I just need a little tiny bit in the bottom that's more than enough, and then I put some salt in. Now, the salt needs to dissolve in the vinegar, so I'm just going to move it around. And you want to add enough salt that eventually you get to the point where some of it can't dissolve. So it needs to be pretty salty. So it looks like it's fully dissolved there. I'll add a little bit more and mix that up. Okay, now the next step, I've still got this glove on my hand. I don't want to be putting oils on the hinge. So I'm just going to take a brush, and I'm going to brush it on. But I don't want this to sit in the liquid. What I want to do is fume it in this glass jar with the sealed lid. So I'll just get the rest of it coated here, then I'll start the reaction. I've got the top of a coffee cup lid here that I've cut that's got legs on it. So I'm just going to take tongs here, put that in, and then put the hinge on top of that. And I can seal up this container and we'll let it sit overnight. With the glue cured, I can now work on making these shelves. So these are 11 inches wide. And they need to be about 10 and a half deep. So I'm going to have one here, one sitting on this, and then another one up here, large enough to be able to put binders in. So I've got the measurements here. I'm all set to go.
I've got a setting on my miter saw that allows me to only cut part way through wood. So I set that to the right depth. And what that allows me to do is to create a rabbit in the board. So this block is going in here. And what that'll allow is wood movement to happen here while providing support for the shelf. I'll just cut it off so I've got a little block here and then the shelf has a secure spot to sit. So I'm just going to glue this in place with high glue. Put a little bit there, a little bit on the block. And that way if someone wants to take this apart in the future, they can certainly do that. So I'll clamp these two in place. And I'm just making use of the existing dado that's here. For the other two, I need a different solution for supporting the shelves. The customer sent me this photo to show how the shelves in the base cabinet are set up. So instead of putting shelf pins in, I'm going to be putting a solid brace under each of the shelves. Another woodworking tip for you is if you need to cut pieces the exact same length, set up what's called a stop block. That way, every time I cut a piece, it's exactly the same length. The key to doing this, though, is making sure you're operating safe. You need to hold down the piece that's between the stop block and the blade to make sure it's fully controlled and it's not going to kick back at you. Here's another good use for deep breech clamps. I don't use these very often, but when I do, they come in very handy. So for the other two shelves, I've got strips I'm going to be putting on here on the side where I've got solid wood to allow for wood expansion and contraction, I'll be putting a slot in here to allow the screw to move. Then when I've got those secured, I can put the shelves on. Some tools make life much easier, and this countersink is one of those. So I can set the depth of the countersink as well as the depth of the pilot hole. So let me just get out my wrench and I'll show you how I set that. So I just use an Allen key in here to loosen off the nut, and that allows me to adjust this. So here's my shelf bracket. This is where the countersink's going, and I want that to go about halfway in here. Tighten that up, and we're good to go. If you're worried I was going to be using rabbits and screws, I've got some old slotted screws here that I will be using. It's just easier to drive them in with a driver first and then put a slotted screw in after. One more tip for you, drill a larger hole through here and here so that the threads of the screws don't bind on the holes. That way you get a nice snug fit. At the rear we've got a slot here, so I'll use a round-headed screw, and that way I've got some play here to allow for wood movement. I'll just ease the edges here with sandpaper, and then install the screws. With this support in, now what I do is install the shelf, and I want to make sure that this shelf support here is level, and that it's not skewed like this so that the shelf will rock. So I just get it to the right height here so it's the same distance and then I can screw it in. I find it easier to put the front screw in here before drilling that back hole. That way I can put the shelf back in. I can test it and make sure I've got it in the exact position I want. And then I can drill my hole.
I'm now ready to put the shelves in, but I still have a rough sawn edge here, so I'll pull up my great grandfather's smoothing plane. This is the logo for fixing furniture. Run a few passes along here, and I can put the shelves in. Do you want to see what a well tuned plane can do? I'm going to unroll the shaving here. So you can see it's the full width of the board. And if I unroll it all the way here, you can see it's the full length of the board as well. So if you've got a really sharp plane, you can do some beautiful work. I've already sanded the surfaces of the shelf, so I'm just easing the edge here with 220 sandpaper. And that way it's going to feel smooth and it won't be a sharp edge. So I can now put this in here. Nice snug fit. I'll get the other two in and then we can move on to the hardware. I hang on to some of these shavings that are full width. That way I've got some material I can use to make tenons thicker when I need to. So let's take a look at how this hardware turned out. So Here's what it looks like compared to the steel. So you can see it's got a lot of tarnish on here. I must have done something on the end there, but I'll wash it off in water and we'll see what it looks like. So dip it in water, clean it up. Well, and it's looking pretty rusty. So it's uh, giving me kind of an inconsistent look but let's see what it compares to this. It's getting brown. So I've just dried this off and you can see there is some brown there. I've taken back a fair bit of that color just with the steel wool. Well, the salt and vinegar solution does age the brass a little bit. It's not getting me the results I'm looking for. It also takes a fair bit of time to let this stand and go through the process. On the other hand, if I use chemicals on a brand new hinge, I can literally watch the color change before my eyes. A word of warning about chemicals though. Make sure you download and understand the safety data sheet, the SDS, because it tells you how to protect your body from these chemicals. I need to be wearing an organic cartridge respirator to protect my lungs. I need goggles and gloves as well. I'm going to be doing this outside because I don't want to be using the chemicals in my workshop. So I'll go outside and we'll see how this works. When tarnishing metals with chemicals, there are a couple different approaches you can use. You can apply it with a brush or with a cloth and you'll get a certain pattern or look to it. The tarnish is happening real time here. I'm not speeding up the camera, so it's going to be a little bit slow, but I want you to see how quickly this works. So there you go, the finished product. There is another option to doing this, and that is diluting the chemicals and then dipping the hardware in that. So you can see how much water I put in here and about the same amount of chemicals, maybe a little bit more. Again, I'm not speeding up the filming here. This is happening in real time. So this is going to be a little bit slower, but you can actually see it changing before your eyes. Watch how the metal changes as the chemicals are taking effect. I'll leave a count down here so you can see how long I'm gonna leave this in here, and then we can take a look at the result.
Now when dipping this, you also have to wash it off afterwards. So I'll stick it in clean water here and then dry it off and we can take a look. And there's the result. What do you think? The chemical process is the way I prefer to age these hinges. It's much faster as you can see, it gives me a consistent result. You just need to make sure that you're working with them very safely. You can buy these chemicals at Kennedy Hardware. I'll leave a link in the video description below. So before I go through and age the rest of these, I do have one hole here that's not aligning with the previous hole. These hinges are just slightly larger. And these are very unique hinges. They're Hoosier cabinet hinges. Uh, very difficult to find. But uh, I got the same design as previous. It's just a little bit longer. So I have to drill a hole. And to do that, I'm going to use another one of my favorite tools. Let me show that to you. This is what's known as a self-centering hinge bit. And it's got a beveled end here that goes in the hinge. And as I push the drill bit, it comes out perfectly centered every single time. So it saves a lot of work. It's very, very accurate. But I want to do this before I age the brass. That way I won't be polishing a certain area if this ends up spinning in the drill. Okay, so that door is now mounted and that gets ready for putting this door in. So I've still got the flower bin on this door. I'll take it off and then what I need to do is put two hinges here and a latch here. To position the hinges here, what I do is just line it up. And I'll show you a trick that I use for that. I use masking tape along the styles here. And then all I do is take a square and mark the point here and here on the door. So I'll get my square out. Measure how far down I've got. So this is two and three quarters. Measure here, two and three quarters. And I've got my hinge position. I just line it up on this point, hold my hinge in place, and then drill my pilot holes. Now another hardware tip for you, if you're installing brass screws into new holes you drilled and it doesn't want to go in, don't force it. You could break that screw. What you want to do is back it out, put a steel screw all the way in, steel's much stronger, back it out, and that way you've made a channel for the brass screw to go in. If you end up breaking off a brass screw, it makes for a lot of work. I've done it a few times building custom furniture and I don't want to do it again. I can now position this door. And I'm using the edge of the hinges here against the wood to line that up. And let's see how that works. So what I'm looking for is these two doors to be exactly level. I'm holding in place. And that works right there. So I'm going to start with that top hole. And I can work my way down once I've got a screw in it. See here, I've got my alignment right, so all I need to do now is put the latch on. 
Hoosier cabinets have these latches on them that you pull up the ring and this lever lifts up to release it. And they do come in right and left. So I've got one that I'm putting on here, but over here I've got one that's also positioned. So I'm going to mount this one first just to make sure I get the level of it properly aligned. And then once I understand that position, I know where to locate this one. Now that I have this latch mounted, I'm going to measure from the top of the door down to the center of this hole here, and that'll give me the position for the other door. Now when I'm working with fine measurements like this, this is where I switch from inches to millimeters, because millimeters I find much easier to read accurately. So I'm going to 186, and I don't have to worry about fractions. You see how this latch extends past the door? I thought that was a problem until I opened this door. You can see that the door actually swings to the right as it opens up. And that's why these hinges are so unique. They're not like any other hinge you find on a cabinet. The pivot point is way out here instead of closer to the cabinet itself. So that's why these are unique hinges for Hoosier cabinets. Now in the package with the latch are included two different plates, one that's got a long hook on it and one that's got a short one. So I need to figure out what's going to work on this particular cabinet. There's a fair bit of distance here on this, so it looks like it's the long one that works here. So I'll get that lined up and screwed in place. Let's give it a try. Yep, that works well. With these critical parts done, I just need to drill holes for the other hinges to make sure they're lined up, and then I can age all the hardware. I'll bring you back when I get it all put together, and we'll take a final look.
This all worked to plan except for one part. This door here doesn't want to close properly. I realized that the catches that came with this hardware allowed me to have one that's closer and one further apart. I need the one that's closer. But that's a quick fix. 10 minutes, I'll have it done just like that. And with that, the cabinet's now finished. So this is a much more functional cabinet for the customer than it was with this large flower bin in it. The key challenge was adding this hardware here so that the door could operate. Now I've got a consistent look across the cabinet, and not only that, it's going to be looking very similar to the base cabinet, so it'll be a seamless look. I think it's looking pretty handsome. If you've got questions about how to tarnish hardware, leave them in the comments below. Perhaps that's a video I could make specifically just on that topic. I hope you enjoyed watching this project, both part one and part two, and watching it transform. And thank you for watching Fixing Furniture. <music>